Today's presentation is Expert Tips for Pediatric Drug Development and Regulatory Success. Next slide, please. Our speakers today are Dr. Eva Gilberglund, Ms. Jacqueline Binns, and Ms. Lynn Georgopoulos. Eva is currently a Senior Director in Clinical Pharmacology and Regulatory Strategy at Sertara. She comes to us with more than 20 years of experience as a reviewer and senior expert in clinical pharmacology at the Swedish Medical Products Agency. Jackie is currently an associate principal regulatory writer in our Synchrogenics division. She brings over 20 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry, clinical diagnostic care and research, and medical writing. Lynn is currently a vice president of regulatory strategy at Sertara. She brings over 30 years of diverse biopharmaceutical and CRO industry experience. Welcome to the webinar. I'll now turn it over to Lynn to begin the presentation. Okay, great. So I think we're going to start. Um, sorry. So the unique challenges in pediatric drug development really require the expertise of a multidisciplinary team to develop a sound and executable pediatric um, development plan and efficient and innovative tools to reduce the burden of trial participation on patients and their families. So over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to provide you with a high-level overview describing the needs and challenges uh, to conducting pediatric research approaches to address those challenges, and the key regulations and processes governing pediatric drug development, and the approach to communicating your plan to regulators. We hope that you will find this webinar informative. So I believe we have a polling question. So for our first polling question, um, we uh, would like to ask, have you been involved um, in developing a pediatric strategy, either a PSP or a PIP. So if you can please select one of the responses. Thanks, Lynn. So we'd like to know where our audience is with their experience in this area. So please select one of the choices. Maybe you've never been involved in developing a pediatric drug development strategy, either a PSP or a PIP. Maybe you've participated in one to three pediatric programs. Maybe you bring four to six pediatric programs worth of experience, or maybe you've just got a ton of experience and you've done more than six programs. So just select your choice, please, and then let us know. All right, so it looks like in this audience, that the majority of people have a little bit of experience, but there's a fair number of people that have, have never participated in a pediatric drug development strategy. So that's great to know. Thank you for participating in that poll. Okay, great. So now, um, if you can wanna to go to the next slide. Uh, can you click? Okay, so historically, um, many drug developers were reluctant to study their drug in children um, owing to ethical concerns and fears of harming children and the perceived liability of testing investigational um, drugs in children. And so many drug developers were further deterred by also the financial constraints and challenges in designing and conducting pediatric trials and frankly, a lack um, of commitment to pediatric drug development. So, so prior to implementation of the pediatric regulations worldwide, most medications uh, prescribed for children uh, were administered on an off-labeled or unlicensed basis. And really 50 to 80% um, of those medications were, were given off-label with an overall highest um, rate in neonates at around 90%. Next, please. And so we know that um, from a developmental and metabolic standpoint, disease processes in children and the responses to therapies are, are unique to those uh, uh, in children uh, compared to adults. And so when drugs lack um, appropriate labeling, use information, uh, it really places clinicians at a significant disadvantage when making treatment decisions. Uh, they have to assume that children are little adults and make dosing recommendations drive solely as fractions of adult dosing rather than on intrinsic factors 
um, based on known differences in growth and development. So clinicians um, must also assume that the safety and effectiveness of, of drugs will be the same uh, in adults and children and generally will rely upon either their own experience, uh, other anecdotal information, and if they're lucky, there may be some case studies or small published studies that can help to direct their treatment decisions. Unfortunately, the scarcity of data uh, can lead clinicians to either withhold potentially beneficial treatments or to administer potentially harmful treatments. Next slide, please. So really, the only way that we can truly protect children is through research. Uh, and rather than from research. And so uh, pediatric drug development is an essential activity to ensure that children, children have access to high quality, age appropriate, reliably evaluated, and evidence-based data to inform appropriate prescribing decisions. Um, uh, there's a way to design clinical programs, uh, such as taking a sequential approach, um, as a way to ensure um, an adequate level of understanding uh, on the medication uh, and response in adults to feel more confident before moving into uh, the pediatric population. So really taking a very much a stepwise approach. And this is very similar to what we're seeing right now uh, with the initiation of pediatric trials with the Moderna COVID vaccine. So studies uh, have been conducted in adults, as everyone's aware. Um, we've confirmed efficacy and initial assessment of safety. Um, the, the vaccine is being administered and trials have been initiated in adolescents. And that's a depiction here in this picture of um, the first adolescent um, being enrolled in a, in a clinical trial. And so the, there is a plan to then um, move into school age children and then subsequently into um, uh, younger children and, and infants um, once additional data is, is, is made available. So again, there are ways to, to work through the process and feeling a level of confidence in conducting um, trials in children. So we can go to the next slide, please. So over the past two decades, regulatory, there's been a number of regulatory initiatives, guidances in pediatric specific legislation, specifically in the US and, and EU, that have had a, a very positive impact on fostering pediatric research and have really um, increased the number of drugs tested and labeled for children. Um, in the US, we had seen some early initiatives starting in around 1994, where um, there was um, the pediatric rule, which was intended to really promote inclusion of pediatric use information um, in the label. And this was the first time that um, uh, the concept of extrapolation, uh, and my colleague Eva is going to be talking in much more detail on that concept, um, whereby patient um, use statements could actually be based on adequate and well-controlled studies in adults, um, providing, of course, that the agency could, could conclude that the disease um, and the drug's effect were sufficiently similar um, across the population, so between adults and, and pediatrics, to permit extrapolation of efficacy uh, from this adult data. Uh, of course, with supplemental information on PK um, and additional safety information. Unfortunately, um, that really didn't make a significant enough impact to really uh, in improve the overall pediatric use information. And it really wasn't until um, legislation um, was put into effect of the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act in, in 2002, and the companion legislation, uh, the Pediatric Research Equity Act in 2003, did really the US begin to see real momentum for change. Um, these regulations um, have been subsequently updated uh, in 2007 and 2012, and most recently in 2017, uh, where PREA was amended with the um, Race for Children's Act, uh, which went into force uh, just last August. And this amendment actually closed a legislative gap that had exempted um, cancer drugs uh, with orphan designation from uh, mandated research uh, uh, in children. So where, um, as the U.S. Um, has two pieces of this companion legislation, uh, Europe has one single unified pediatric regulation that was introduced in 2007, which was heavily inspired by the U.S. regulations. Um, as of uh, 2019, uh, Switzerland now mandates pediatric drug development, um, which is uh, based on the EU framework. Um, and then, of course, following Brexit, uh, the UK also now mandates um, independently pediatric drug development. And again, uh, they also follow the EU framework. And we'll talk a little bit uh, more later in the presentation about the specifics um, if, as to what's included in those regulations. And so really, um, the, the US and EU legislative uh, frameworks really have been at the forum, forefront of stimulating um, 
international collaboration and pediatric drug development efforts. So next slide, please. So as we can see here um, in the US, um, since uh, the institution of the regulations, over 800 products have been labeled uh, with pediatric use information. And we've seen similar success uh, in Europe where um, uh, almost 300 uh, new medicines have been authorized uh, for use uh, in children. Um, and you know, we can really see the benefit of these regulations as we compare those to countries um, that do not currently have um, pediatric regulations, when we look at it in comparison to Japan and Canada, for instance. So the regulations really have had a, a, a really um, profound impact on the products um, being approved for children. Next slide, please. But despite this uh, tremendous effort um, and numerous in, in these regulatory initiatives and in, in advancing uh, pediatric drug development, we still do see off-label um, use of medications, which is still at around now 40%. So although we've had a number of products approved, uh, there is still certainly room for improvement. Um, and also when we look um, that uh, the lag between uh, approval from adults and to pediatric um, use labeling, on average, it takes about nine years. Of course, that's very dependent on the condition, um, but it is, it is uh, unusually long and we really uh, need to take um, measures to, to reduce that, that, that gap. So really um, taking a, a harmonized and globally fo focused approach um, to ensure these safe and efficient and ethical studies um, that are conducted in the pediatric population will hopefully um, uh, uh, close that gap. So next slide, please. So, um, and if you can advance one click, please. Okay, great. So fortunately, um, most pediatric diseases um, are rare. Um, uh, so, but this, does present challenges when it comes to designing clinical trials that year yield interpretable, interpretable results. Rather, so um, just as an example, um, in 2020 there was an estimated 1.8 million new cases of cancer um, that will be diagnosed in the U.S. And less than one percent, which is around 16,000 of those cases, will actually occur in children. So when we further then subdivide this into the specific cancer types, we're working with very small populations. And that really is uh, one of those main hurdles that we really need to work uh, with to, to overcome limitations in, in pediatric research. And so now with these small populations, uh, we have to take into consideration the developmental and metabolic differences across the population. So as you can well imagine, that dosing in neonates is vastly different from uh, dosing in adolescent uh, when it comes to, for instance, how much uh, and how we actually dose these patients. So for instance, when we think about uh, an orally administered drug, uh, we likely can give an adolescent the same dosage form that we're using an adult. But there's not, but that's not the case uh, rather for young children who can't swallow a standard, standard tablet formulation and uh, requires an age appropriate formulation to be developed um, that can also um, accurately uh, uh, be dose adjusted as needed. So some uh, additional hurdles um, uh, that have to be overcome is that not only, uh, again, um, that, that we have the, the benefit of the pediatric regulation, there's also then um, uh, competition for, the, for these very small populations. So, um, you know, again, we're, we're dealing with a, a, an already very limited pool of potential patients. Um, and so uh, it really is, is um, important that we consider um, our, our programs to be run on, on a global basis. And one of the other hurdles that we have to incur challenges, I should say, that we have to deal with is really getting a parent and a child to agree to study participation. Um, and th this can be particularly challenging. Um, ethically, um, if a child who is capable of giving assent does not agree to take part in a study, uh, they cannot be enrolled, even if the parent or legal guardian consents uh, for the child's participation. Uh, uh, unfortunately, um, we see a limited number of trained investigators uh, and patient-friendly facilities to deal with the ability um, to enroll patients in clinical trials. We see um, a lack of uh, clinically val validated outcome measures that can really produce um, meaningful, full, meaningful data to assess whether or not the drug is of benefit in, in children. And we also have a, a, um, a limited um, some limitations to the 
experienced laboratories who can really handle small volumes of blood for PK and safety sampling. So all of these hurdles, there's ways to overcome them uh, if we take them one at a time. Um, and we're going to be talking uh, uh, about that um, in the upcoming slides. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to um, really talk uh, and frame up some key uh, guiding principles for pediatric drug development. So as you're thinking about your pediatric plans and as we talk about some of the solutions, there's some, some guiding principles that, that should be, be kept in mind. So um, first, um, I, I'm gonna, I should mention that I'm going to highlight some key principles, but certainly uh, would encourage anyone um, who's going to be working or planning to uh, work in pediatric drug development, if there's a number of resources um, at your disposal, uh, uh, that, that really should be consulted um, in advance. So pediatric patients, um, you know, as, as we said, I mean, our, our, our charge is to um, protect and to provide adequate and safe medications for children. But it's really important in order to assure that uh, the safety and effectiveness of these medications that they have been appropriately evaluated for their intended use in, in, the, in the targeted population. And so when pediatric use is anticipated, drug development programs should include uh, uh, pediatric trials. And these studies should be conducted in pediatric populations having the disease or condition um, of interest. So we do, we do not conduct um, trials in healthy volunteer patients. Uh, in children as we would do in adults, so there is a different approach there. There needs to be the availability of age-appropriate formulations that I mentioned um, as we need to ensure the safe and accurate dosing in children. And then the timing of pediatric development should take into consideration the types of diseases being treated, safety considerations uh, uh, that includes non-clinical as well as clinical, and the efficacy and safety of all other alternative methods. So taking this as in the totality really helps um, guide uh, how you're going to design your pediatric child. And then really, children should not be enrolled in a clinical study unless necessary to achieve an important pediatric public health need. And really what this means is that the, we should be able to capitalize on the existing knowledge that we have in order to optimize trial designs. And that's really um, uh, through use uh, that can be supported through use of modeling and simulation and extrapolation that, again, uh, Eva will expand upon further. So next slide, please. So, um, you know, as, I, as I've kind of just highlighted at a really high level, though our unique challenges or hurdles that we need to overcome, um, there are innovative solutions and tools that can help to, to um, facilitate pediatric research. And so um, this is really through the application of model-informed drug development. So if we look at sort of the, the key three areas, which is informing on clinical trial design, leveraging uh, our knowledge for bridging those knowledge gaps, and then to support dose selection and optimization. So if we first take um, informing clinical trial design, the use of, of model-informed drug development can really help us to work with these small sample sizes. Um, so uh, whether or not, and even on the, on the design, for instance, the comparative versus open label, um, what the PK, PK um, sampling scheme to optimize um, sample collection, again, as we talked about the hurdle of, of working with small um, blood volumes, uh, how do we select the appropriate dose? How do we titrate? What is the design? Um, how can we consider um, sequential dosing versus um, uh, maybe uh, you know grouping um, one or two of pediatric cohorts together, as an example? Evaluating um, PKPD modeling and then actually doing a virtual clinical trial simulation so that we can we can do some uh, predictions um, before actually enrolling again, very precious patients into these trials. It's important for us to, to leverage the knowledge um, and, and that we have to bridge the knowledge gaps. So for instance, if we're able to look at our exposure response uh, in, in adults and can leverage that information uh, to the pediatric population, that can help um, also, again, uh, going back to the clinical trial design. So also um, what's important when we consider um, for dose selection and optimization, identifying those covariates such as weight, age, and BMI as an example that can help us um, to, um, to really optimize, um, again, the, the, the uh, dosing for pediatric patients based on our, our known information if it is available in adults or from, for instance, one older um, pediatric population to a younger population 
So um, we can also then um, look at uh, the application of model inform development to um, bridge, for instance, when we talk about developing pediatric specific formulations. So how we can bridge between adult and pediatric formulations. Um, and then there's also the ability to incorporate um, pediatric ontogeny. So for instance, as we as I mentioned, you know, you have this vastly different population from infants through um, adolescents where you have um, at the neonatal infant side where you may have um, uh, organ development that is not fully matured versus maybe hormonal differences in the adolescent population and all of these factors need to be considered. And there's uses of modeling and simulation that can help us to understand the impact of those developmental differences on how a patient's gonna handle the drug. Um, and it, um, all of these tools really um, can, can help us to be successful in uh, implementing and accelerating pediatric development. I just wanted to quickly mention um, on the next slide, please, just a case example, because I think sometimes when we talk about these concepts in abstract, just to really see how in fact they are applied um, practically. So I wanted to just highlight a recent case example uh, for partial onset seizures. And there was um, a guidance that was issued out from FDA in 2019 that talked about um, the use of full extrapolation uh, for efficacy from adults to pediatric patients two years of age and older to support um, labeling in this population. So historically, for instance, claims of efficacy have been based on adequate and well-controlled studies. Uh, whether that's in adults or pediatrics. So you're talking double blind placebo controlled trials that can require a few hundred to several hundred patients. So as we've learned, and if we know that the disease is, is, is similar and there's ways to model, uh, for instance, with exposure response modeling, that we can um, actually uh, optimize that trial design. So we can take um, all the information that is known, for instance, um, if, if for instance, the FDA looked back and analyzed um, 30 clinical trials to see, you know, is there similarities in dose response um, in between adults and pediatrics? We were then able to, they were able to then say, okay, um, we can we can really leverage all of that known information and limit what we're going to have to do in pediatrics to really just conducting PK and safety studies in around 100 patients, as an example. So this really then takes us from you know, the, all the complexities of, of conducting um, placebo controlled trials down to an open label trial. And again, that all has a positive impact on, on whether or not an, a parent or a child is going to agree to participate in a study, how the study is being conducted. Um, so there's really, as you can see, as this as an example of really the power of, of utilizing well-informed drug development. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Eva, who's really going to then give you um, a, a really closer, provide a closer look at um, the use of extrapolation and all the details around that. Thank you, Lynn. So I will talk a bit now about how we put our pediatric development plan together uh, with using modeling informed drug development as really the net and extrapolation as the core. Uh, so next slide, please. So as Lynn has been pointing out, there are several challenges to pediatric studies. Uh, an important one is small populations, but we can also not use, for example, healthy volunteers. We are uh, studying developing children under maturation. Uh, we have less approved comparators. We have issues when it comes to endpoints, especially maybe the self-assessment ones. We have ethical concerns and also uh, using placebo and also practical limitations, for example, blood volume limits, and we need to be as little invasive as, as possible in our study. So the solution to these uh, challenges is to use extrapolation. So we maximize the use of all data that we have at hand, and we minimize the data needed in the pediatric population. Um, next slide, please. So in order to obtain marketing approval of a new drug, the drug developer must provide support of efficacy and safety of the drug. If evidence usually relies on data generated in a well-controlled and powered clinical efficacy and safety studies. But in certain cases, you can use already available data and apply them on a new population. So you can uh, see if it's possible to extrapolate, for example, efficacy. Um, and here you usually 
uh, you go from a reference population to a test population and the reference population here is usually adult patients but it can also be for example older um, pediatric patients and extrapolating to younger pediatric patients. So here you see uh, a sample of the guidelines that you have uh, ex uh, access to. Uh, thank you. Um, so you have uh, ICH guidelines on this. You have um, an addendum uh, to the ICH pediatric guideline that talks about extrapolation. And there is also um, a standalone guideline coming up uh, uh, where only a, a concept paper has been published. But we'll, that will also talk in detail about extrapolation, trying to harmonize the concepts and also talk a lot about study design, statistics and everything that you need to consider in pediatric drug development. FDA and EU of, of also, of course, have their own um, clinical pharmacology pediatric guidelines and EU also have an extrapolation guideline. Next slide, please. So here we will go into details when it comes to the extrapolation of efficacy. Um, so here you have a framework where you can see, you look at the level of uncertainty and then uh, that rules how much data that you need to generate. So you are trying to understand if you can leverage uh, efficacy data in adults for your drug to a pediatric population or from older children to younger children. And you look at the similarity in disease, uh, in diagnosis, in disease course, uh, treatment results, for example, um, um, efficacy, uh, the exposure response relationship from other drugs, either drugs that have the same or similar mechanism of action or just uh, drugs that are used to treat your, the disease. You also, if you can, you look at the developmental changes in drug targets. Um, so if you are in a situation where you can't make any assumptions, let's say that you don't have much information uh, about the disease mechanistically uh, in children as compared to adults, and maybe you, you know that already uh, that the diseases are different, then you make a no extrapolation approach and then you need to provide full efficacy data and the PK. In all these situations, regardless of extrapolation approach, you always need to provide safety as well, or almost always. Um, so if you can assume that you will have efficacy of your drug in, in the um, pediatric population, but you are not sure that the efficacy re exposure response is the same, then you go for a partial extrapolation. And a partial extrapolation can be done in many ways. One way is to, if you feel quite confident that you will have the same exposure response, you can go for showing that the exposure response is similar in adult and pediatrics, and you just provide that and maybe some limited efficacy data. But you can also go for an approach where you are uh, determining the PKPD relationship in pediatric population and then compare that to adults or going for the target exposure uh, based on your PKPD analysis in pediatric patients. If you have good support that the exposure response is similar in adults and children, you can go for a full extrapolation approach. And that was very similar to the example that Lim was just now giving. And there it would be enough then to just study PK and to perform exposure matching to support efficacy. Next slide, please. Here you have the decision tree that is outlined in the FDA clinical pharmacology and pediatrics uh, guidance. I'm not going to go into detail here. The concepts are very similar as on the previous slides. You look at the disease, you look at response to intervention and whether you think that the exposure response is similar in the pediatric target population or, or not and thereby you choose no extrapolation, partial extrapolation, or full extrapolation. Next slide, please. 
So here you have the questions that are outlined in the ICH extrapolation framework. And again, this is very similar. You focus on the disease, you focus on similarities in exposure response, and then look at what uncertainties and limitations do we have at the moment, and then what additional information can be generated to bridge those information gaps. Next slide, please. So here you have an outline of the modeling and simulation strategy in the different approaches. So modeling and simulation is central to pediatric drug development, both when planning and when analyzing the results. So here on the left, you have the planning stage where you are using simulation to propose doses that are likely to um, end up with your target exposure. You also use uh, mod modeling to support your sampling um, regimens and your, and your sampling times and also the study size. Then to the left, you are analyzing re your results. And here you use the available data to uh, make sure that your pediatric patients end up with exposures that are within the target exposure range all over the age or body weight range of the pediatric population. So if we look at this in detail, in the full extrapolation approach, you use your ad adult POPPK or PPPK model together with your adult exposure response and you have the target exposure. So there you simulate doses that provides the target exposure also in the pediatric population and those are the doses for your study. If you have partial extrapolation, you do the same. Uh, either you are having the same target exposure as in adults, so you use the same doses as for the full extrapolation approach if you are just aiming at confirming that exposure response is the same, or you use modeling for setting the target exposure range in your study where you are uh, determining the pediatric PKPD relationship. And uh, then you simulate doses that will provide that ex target exposure. If you have no extrapolation at all, so then you use the adult model together with the information from exposure response in adults. Uh, and then setting the target exposure range for your pediatric dose finding study. Um, so here in the planning, modeling and simulation is essential. When you are analyzing your results, so in the full extrapolation case, you use then your population PK model updated with your pediatric data and the adult PKPD. Um, and uh, you get your target, you have your target exposure, and then you are making sure that the doses in your label will provide the target exposure all the way along your pediatric uh, age or, or uh, body weight, for example, range. When you have a partial approach, you use your updated population model, and uh, either you go for the same exposures as in adults, or you go for a pediatric uh, directed exposures based on the PKPD, uh, and you make sure that your labeling doses will provide those exposures. Um, and the same, if you have no extrapolation, you use your updated model together with the pediatric exposure response, uh, then having your target exposure in the pediatric patients and making sure that your label dose uh, provides exposure inside. Um, this target exposure. I should also say that um, it's important also to look at safety here. So the, the exposure safety modeling will then support the upper limit of your target exposure range. Uh, and it's very valuable in general when it comes to the clean farm assessments, when it comes to situations with increased exposure. You have a good reference here in the upper right corner. Uh, where you have more examples uh, outlined. It's from EFPIA, uh, the MIDD working group, uh, and you can find more examples there on extrapolation. Next slide, please. So what about safety? So can we extrapolate safety or, and do we do that? So if we remember that we have 
uh, clinical studies in pediatric patients with very small populations. And usually the exposures that we have are uh, the same as in adults or potentially um, they can be lower, but it's very uncommon for them to be higher. Um, so uh, we are essentially, um, whether we think about it or not, we are extrapolating safety because we will not be able to detect so much the, uh, adverse effects in those clinical studies. They are small. We can discover the, the more common adverse effects. So what we should do is to think if this is valid, uh, what do we know from similar drugs? Do we need to have extra post-marketing surveillance? Are we having any signals of some kind of follow-up? And this is outlined in the EU Clinical Pharmacology and Pediatrics Guideline. And there is also, uh, otherwise I must say that it's very rare uh, that this is being discussed, but there is an EU draft pediatric addendum in antibacterials that it has been out for comments and has not yet been finalized where um, they are describing uh, extrapolation of safety unless we have signals that we have a particular safety concern in a certain age subject and then providing the fluoroquinolones as an example of this. So sometimes our number of patients are very small and in particular if we are dealing with rare diseases um, and uh, I just uh, outlined the examples from FDA approvals where the patient population has been very limited in either the full pediatric range or in part of the range. And uh, it's difficult to have data in these diseases. So here one can really say that we are extrapolating. Next slide, please. So where do we find information? So we need to find information about the disease, um, treatment response, uh, preferences from the regulators, what do they want to see? So of course we look at scientific literature, we also talk to clinical experts. There are clinical regulatory EU and US guidance uh, out on their webs. Um, there is very high level information about the, the pediatric investigational plans published on the EMA website. Um, the public clinical trial database is, is a good source of more detailed information and we also have published assessment reports and reviews on uh, the agency's webs and uh, at the EMA web we have something called article 46 reports where article 46 is uh, part of the pediatric regulation and is a requirement to report um, pediatric study results within six months after study completion. So here it's possible to find quite recent data being assessed and, and the idea is also that this should go into the label. Next slide please. So now I'm going to talk a bit about where the pediatric development is when, it, when we are looking at the full drug development. Next slide please. So when in the development program should we perform the pediatric studies? So I think that we are missing a top axis here. Can we see if you go, if you click once to see if it goes, thank you, perfect. Um, can you click once more? Thank you. Okay, so this is the typical pediatric development and, and the, um, Typically, uh, the pediatric study starts after the completion of phase three in adults. And the reason for this is that we want to know the risk benefit in adults before we start with the pediatric studies. However, you have to plan for your pediatric studies quite early in, your, uh, in, in the adult drug development. So both because you are submitting to the regulators pediatric uh, development plans quite early, EU is the earliest ones already going in the beginning of phase two. You will hear more about that. And then FDA end of phase two. So you need to set the stage and you have to plan. So uh, you use modeling 
uh, you usually have a population PK modeling uh, uh, ongoing during your development. It's very important and you can also use your PBPK model to inform that during the development. That is also useful for different um, um, questions during review and, this, and the documentation. Um, so you use these modelings to um, set the, the dose um, in the pediatric studies to optimize the size of the study and to optimize the, the sampling times. If you are going for an approach where you're going to use a PD marker, um, then you probably need to uh, validate that and to use that also in your adult studies. So you should think ahead and not to lose that opportunity uh, to include PD markers. Um, you also, when it comes to the then the pediatric study, you have different outlines of your study. Um, so you can, if you want to be extra cautious, you can go for a stepwise approach where you start with older children and you go slowly into lower and lower age groups. So you start um, looking, you start, for example, with adolescents and you when you have enough safety and PK in that population for allowing the next uh, younger age group to start, you, you go for that. So you go sequentially down in age. Um, and you can also have an approach where you have a PK lead-in. So you have a more e extensive uh, PK characterizations in, in a few patients in an age group uh, before you allow uh, inclusion of uh, more patients in the same age group. And uh, this is particularly useful if you have extra uncertainties regarding your PK estimation and your dose selection. For example, if you have um, really small children uh, being studied, it can be more challenging to predict exposures in, for example, neonates and infants. Uh, another um, situation might be if you have the disease, for example, that can potentially influence the PK. Let's say that you have an effect on the GI tract uh, that can imp have an influence on absorption. So um, uh, these are good design features to consider. And here I should also take the opportunity to say that I have outlined here the age ranges that are given in the ICH guideline, but I think that both in EU and, and the US, uh, the regulators want to go away from the guide, this set uh, age groups and to have a more data-driven approach. So also here, uh, you should have your age range being data-driven, really depending on where you see that you have the most uncertainties. Uh, either when it comes to safety or when it comes to, um, uh, to PK um, uh, uncertainty. So besides uh, planning uh, your, uh, your dosing and, and sampling and, and study size with modeling, uh, you also have to think about other things before you start your pediatric study. So you need to have your juvenile toxicity study ready uh, at the point before you start, and you also need to have the age-appropriate pediatric formulation being ready for use in the clinical study. Next slide, please. Uh, can you click once more, please? Thank you. And I think one more click also. No? Okay, let's go back. Um, so uh, age-appropriate formulations are required in EU and US and uh, the development of an age-appropriate formulation is part of the pediatric development plans for both regions. Uh, uh, what kind of formulation that you choose is dependent on your, your physical chemical properties of the drug and also the age group that you are targeting. So ordinary sized tablets and capsules can usually be used uh, at least in adolescents. But if you go down in younger children, you might encounter children that cannot swallow this. Uh, and the lower you go, the more frequent it will become. Um, small patients can train and they can be used to take uh, tablets, but you can count on that everyone will. 
So uh, tablets down to a millimeter of six, six millimeters in diameter uh, is okay for children down to six years of age. And then if you go lower, you can use mini tablets, for example, having a diameter of two millimeters. Um, and that you can use down for, in, for infants. You also have to look at the excipients to see that they are suitable for the age range. You have to think about your dose strength and maybe how easy the day can be, be adjusted if you need to do that after your trial. Uh, you need to plan the bridging between adult and pediatric formulations with, with a relative bioavailability study. Uh, and you need to confirm your PEK in the, in the clinical study. So you need to have the formulation ready when you start your study and investigate then acceptability, palatability and swallowability during the preclinical trial. If you have a device, you might also need to do a human factor testing in children if, you're going to, if they're going to self-administrate and you have more information in the cited guideline. Next slide, please. So uh, just some few words on juvenile toxicity. So there is a great guideline on this, the ICH S11, that talks about the, the use and, and the uh, designs of studies in, in juvenile toxicity studies. Uh, it's really a risk-based approach. It's based on age group, uh, treatment duration, PD selectivity, and also if you have any effects on developing organs. Any role of your target, of course, in organ development is also uh, important to know if you if you have that information and available in vivo data. And they also provide very good study design recommendations and, and cite which uh, drugs that uh, these studies are not needed for. Next slide, please. So as you see, based on these slides, um, the pediatric development planning is a multidisciplinary approach. You need to have all these competences when you are doing your pediatric plan. You need to have toxicology for the safety and juvenile tox, clinical pharmacology, for example, for your extrapolation and dose selection and, and um, thinking about maturation effects, regulatory affairs, uh, CMC for your pediatric formulation, uh, modeling and simulation expertise is very important. It's really the, the, the basis of the full approach. Clinical development expertise, um, working on the, the design endpoints and study with feasibility and logistics. And then if you have access to real world evidence, you can leverage many different parts of, of your plan, including the, for example, the placebo response in the clinical study. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to give the microphone to Lynn, who's going to talk more about the, the regulations in US and EU. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Eva. So I'm, um, you know, to make sure that we have enough time for Jack, because it's really, I think, important um, to really understand the content and the timing for the um, pediatric plans to be submitted to regulatory authorities. I'm just going to go, uh, really discuss at a very high level. Um, what is what is needed from the EU US perspective is with, with regard to the regulations. So um, just to, to understand that every planned marketing application, whether it be in the US or EU, will have to have an associated pediatric plan based on the applicable product class. Okay, so I, um, the uh, products in the US that are under development, whether they're drugs or biologics, including biosimilars, if they are not considered interchangeable, and so therefore would be considered a new active ingredient. Um, any changes in indication, dosage form, dosing regimens, route of administration of a product under development will require a pediatric plan. Similarly, in Europe, um, a drug or biologic, although it does not include biosimilars, um, any new indications, pharmaceutical forms um, that are still under a supplemental protection certification must have a pediatric plan filed. The one key difference um, that I wanted to talk about um, specifically is the actual scope of the condition to be studied in children as it relates to whether it's the adult application, the original marketing application, or can even be for a pediatric app, the initial pediatric application, if you're, for instance, developing in, in an older pediatric population. Okay, so in the United States, the indication under review. So for instance, if, if a product is being developed for treatment of moderate to severe 
active Crohn's disease. Um, that is the same indication that would be required for evaluation in the pediatric population. So any development arguments for deferral waivers, et cetera, are all centered on that particular indication. In Europe, it actually centers on the condition. So there's an ev evaluation of the hierarchy by MEDRA. So for instance, if you're developing a product um, for say coronary artery disease in, in the adult population, as an example, um, even if the condition, that particular um, indication isn't applicable to pediatrics, you have to evaluate it in terms of condition um, to see if there's any related conditions to the higher level. Okay, so it really is going to require companies to take a closer look to see how they're going to position their pediatric development uh, in terms of the condition rather than the actual indication under development. From a timing perspective, Jackie will cover the timing uh, for submission of, of PIPs and PSPs. Um, there are some exceptions to the products that require a pediatric plan. So in Europe, generics, hybrids, traditional herbal products, as I mentioned, biosimilar as well established. Prod use products are not um, are exempt from the requirements of the pediatric regulations. There's also class waiver products um, that are also automatically exempt in Europe. Now there is a list um, uh, that of, of potential um, class waivers, or I shouldn't say class waivers, but for indications that where pediatric studies can be waived in the U.S. But even though there's this list, um, a, a PIP, I mean, sorry, a, a an IPSP still needs to be filed in the U.S. In general, um, products that have orphan designation are exempt from the regulations, from pediatric regulations in the U.S., with the exception of, of the products that are under development um, uh, for um, oncology and that are covered by uh, the Race for Children's Act. So there's provisions that if um, there is a new and, and this is, again, the first application that is submitted um, to treat an adult cancer. Um, even if it has orphan designation, if that drug is directed at a molecular target that is relevant for the pediatric cancers, I would encourage you to consult. The, um, there's a, a guidance document specific to the description of what's covered under the requirements for the RACE Act. And that did go into effect um, in August. So um, anyone who is developing uh, uh, an oncology product should carefully evaluate whether or not their product um, needs to be, uh, is subject to the pediatric requirements. Um, just quickly, uh, key incentives. Um, there are associated key incentives with, under the European regulations for additional exclusivity. Although in the US under PREA, the, um, anything uh, supporting exclusivity is actually under the PPCA and not under, um, under PREA. So there's a separate process for that. So if you can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so certainly, um, I would encourage uh, uh, early interactions with the agency. There's there's mechanisms in the U.S. and EU to actually talk about the pediatric programs in advance. Um, uh, you can request um, a deferral, um, uh, and that means really deferring a study is 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 deferring um, after the submission of the marketing application in the in the U.S. or in Europe. Okay, it doesn't mean deferring until after you receive approval. And that's a really important point. So it is getting much more difficult, I will tell you, to defer studies, uh, the initiation of trials in pediatrics. Again, trying to reduce that, that, that window for submission. There is a mechanism to request a waiver. So for instance, whether it's a safety concern um, or the disease does not occur in, that, in a particular subpopulation, pediatric subpopulation, you can justify a waiver for excluding that particular group. Um, and there are specific provisions for what constitutes um, a waiver, both in Europe and in the US, okay? So with that, I just wanna um, hand this over to Jackie, who's really gonna talk to you then about preparing and submitting the actual pediatric plans. Great, thanks, Lynn. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, as mentioned by both Lynn and Eva, there are many factors to take into consideration when developing a pediatric plan. Most of the information included in both the PIP and the IPSP will be similar, including the background on the disease, product information, details concerning the extrapolation plan, the pediatric formulation, toxicology, the clinical studies plan, the plan for waivers and deferrals, as well as a description of any other agency agreement that has been received 
and the overall pediatric development timelines. For the PIP submission, there are also additional forms such as the application form and the key elements form that must be submitted along with the PIP. Next slide, please. This slide and the next slide um, present um, the excuse me, the schematic comparing the content in each application. Kindly note that the FDA provides a general outline to be used. However, the EMA provides a word template with guidance text that must be used when drafting the pediatric plan. All forms for both um, FDA and EMA are provided on their websites respectively. Next slide, please. And this is just a continuation of the content outline for both documents, showing the similarities of the content to be included within. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, uh, for PIP submissions, an application form and a key elements form must be included. The application form must include the date of completion for the adult PK studies, which are typically the phase one first in human studies. If the date included is later than six months from the completion of these studies, the application will be considered late and an explanation is required to be provided. The key elements forms should include only the essential details for the proposed pediatric plan, as these are binding and will be included in the compliance check during the review procedure. Some examples of content to be included in the key elements form are details concerning the pediatric formulation, supportive non-clinical studies, details of the proposed pediatric studies, and plans for the modeling and simulation and extrapolation studies. Next slide, please. If you could click a couple more times. Perfect, thank you. As required by the regulations, the pediatric planning process occurs much earlier in the EU than in the US. In the EU, the PIP should be submitted no later than the end of the healthy subject or the PK studies, which can coincide with the initiation of the adult phase two proof of concept studies. It cannot be submitted after initiation of the phase three pivotal or conformatory trials. While it's acknowledged that submitting a pediatric plan early in development can be challenging as a sponsor will likely have limited information on the overall product development plan, it is expected that the PIP will undergo multiple revisions during its development. As I stated, if the PIP is not submitted after completion of the initial PK studies, the submission will be considered late and justification uh, should be noted. Submission of a UK PIP is similar to the EU requirements and a PIP produced specifically for Switzerland referred to as a CH PIP is again fundamentally a <clears throat> excuse me, fundamentally geared to the requirements of the EU. However, it's submitted along with the marketing application. In the US, submission is after the end of phase two meeting. There are additional caveats in the event that there is no end of phase two meeting, which includes submitting before the phase three or the combination phase two, phase three studies begin. If there are no phase three or combination studies, the IPSP must be submitted at least 210 days prior to the planned NDA or BLA filing. Next slide, please. In the EU, applications are submitted in accordance to a published schedule. The key point here is that once the sponsor receives the day 60 opinion, the clock stops and there is not a specified timeline to respond. It's suggested that the sponsor plan to respond within about three months, if possible. And once this is resubmitted, it again goes under review with a final opinion provided at day 120. Prior to submission of the marketing application, the agency will validate whether the sponsor is compliant with the requirements outlined in the PIP. Next slide, please. In the US, the process follows a more strict timeline. Although the application can be submitted at any time, once it is submitted, the sponsor must respond to FDA comments or queries and reach agreement within 90 days. Otherwise, the application is considered not agreed. A sponsor must have an agreed plan to submit along with the marketing application. Next slide, please. 
And just in summary, some best practices and tips for preparing a successful pediatric plan include being proactive in the planning process for the clinical development program, including the integration of pediatric activities into the overall program, allow adequate time to prepare the plan while utilizing the resources available, such as regulatory guidance and other information on the EMA and FDA websites. There are also um, opinions available for uh, approved PIPs and post-marketing commitments for approved products on both EMA and FDA websites, respectively. Ensure all necessary parties are represented on the pediatric team. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Reach out to external experts such as KOLs and pediatricians who have expertise in the field. And please be sure to maintain open communication with the regulators and take advantage of scientific advice. Be sure to focus on the big picture and take into consideration the entire pediatric plan and how each component has an influence on the others. Now I'd like to turn it back over to Suzanne for Q&A. Okay, thank you so much, Lynn and Eva and Jackie. And we just have time for a few questions. Um, Eva, someone wants to know if the clinical study report isn't available within six months after the end of the pediatric study, but with a delay of less than 12 months, what's the justification, or sorry, what are the consequences and what justification do you need to provide and who do you need to provide it to? Oh, Suzanne, I think you have to take that again. So if the if the study report is not provided within six months. After the end of the study, but with a delay of less than 12 months. I yeah, I think I have to think a bit about that one. I actually don't know by heart. I know I know the requirement is six months, but I don't know what happens if you are delayed. I don't know if uh, Lynn or Jackie, do you know the answer to this question? So I'm, I guess I'm not maybe uh, completely understanding the question. Is this regarding like a for um, justification for not? Yeah, I think it's ju it's justification uh, for it not being available. We can we can always uh, think on it and get back to the yeah. person who asked Yeah, yeah, I think that would be best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, Eva, can you comment on some examples of when a full extrapolation approach can be applied? Yeah, so so um, a typical uh, uh, product to do that for would be antibiotics, for example, where you can really well support that you have the same uh, PKPD or exposure response. Uh, but you, you can have other situations as, as well where you have very good data to support the same exposure response. For example, if you are uh, second or third in class and others have already been showing this and you have access to that data. Sometimes you can also look at the labeling to see if, they, if uh, the doses are doses that then will end up with the same exposures in pediatrics as in adults. Perfect, thanks Eva. Um, Jackie, could you comment on how much detail you need to commit to in a, a KEF, a key elements form? Sure, absolutely. Um, while you wanna include key information and the, the form is pretty, straightforward in with the open fields that need to be populated you want to make sure that you include enough detail concerning um, your planned studies and concerning the age-appropriate formulation such as you know primary and secondary endpoints for the proposed studies as well as um, you know some inclusion exclusion criteria as necessary but um, at, you don't want to overcommit as well, and then details of your modeling and simulation and extrapolation plan as well. The key elements form does provide guidance text as well concerning the key information that should also be included in case there are questions. Okay, yeah, great. Looks like we have one last question. It's for Lynn. Um, someone was asking about human factors and if you can comment on them for, for maybe device and, and uh, drug testing in children. So, um, for instance, uh, human factor studies um, are required, uh, and I'm just thinking in terms as an example, um, 
uh, of using um, like a special type of dosing device or instructions for self-use. So if you have a, um, a pediatric patient who needs to be able to self-administer a drug like an inhaled, you know, um, an asthma inhaler as an example, you actually have to include that the um, pedi information um, as to whether or not the pediatric patient is capable of, 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 of uh, appropriately dosing the product. So there's um, uh, studies that will need to be conducted along with that. But we can certainly, you know, if there's um, any more detailed questions uh, specific to that, we can certainly respond um, via email uh, as a follow-up. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Eva and Lynn and Jackie for that, that really excellent and thorough presentation. Next slide, please. We've got a few short announcements before concluding the webinar. The next webinar in the series will be on April 7th when Fran Brown and Oliver Letham will present Sealing Pharmaceutical Commercialization Deals, Creating Optimal Value for Investors. You can register for all webinars by visiting sertara.com. On behalf of Sertara, I'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. This concludes the webinar. Goodbye and have a great day.